So uh, we'll get this meeting started now, and I welcome all of you to the meeting. Uh, before we get started with the presentation, I want to acknowledge that I live in the unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. And I expect that uh, some of you will be coming to us from different parts of uh, the country and different territories. Uh, I'm very pleased today to have uh, a presenter, Linda Wong, who is not from the Emeritus Group, but from the Faculty Women's Club that we often participate with. So uh, uh, Linda volunteered and I was thrilled to have uh, her volunteer to do this. And so uh, I'm going to hand this over to Linda at this time. I'm going to ask her to share the screen and let her introduce herself a little bit more uh, and then okay. we'll see directly with the presentation. So Linda, over to you. Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction and uh, welcome to everybody uh, on this fine afternoon and I know you want to get out there again. So this is, uh, I hope, will be a good use of your time and I know you're a very keen group for traveling. So this is um, my trip to Norway that took place earlier this year. So I'm going to just start now. So the focus of this was knitting and northern lights and the coastal ferry route with uh, well-known knitting designers, Arna and Carlos. So you can see there uh, the little bag in the upper left is the kit bag you'll hear more about. Um, the mitts are hand-knit Norwegian mitts, and they I brought them from home. And then the cord, which is like my cord here, is what I got when I was on the heavy uh, ferry. And the cord starts where we got on in Bergen, goes right up to the top and turns back just like that cord. So Linda, can I ask you to, if you wish, to put it on play so that it comes out full screen? Oh, I'm sorry. You got the whole thing. Sorry. Yes, thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Is that a little better now? Do you have the mm -hmm. whole thing? Yeah. Yes. So the uh, journey starts near the tip of the thumb that's in Oslo over to the Havia Express. So the first stop uh, for my sister Susan and me was at the Monk Museum, which opened in 2021. We had about five days before we joined the group. From uh, one of the sites we went to, we got this fabulous view of Oslo, which is Norway's capital, population of about 700,000. Uh, they have rejuvenated their harbor so it's a jewel for all Norwegians and you can walk about 10 kilometers if it's not cold uh, all the way along there and in the far distance you see some snow and that's where the Holman uh ski jump hill is and the building on the far right or towards the right the gray one is the Monk Museum. This is the famous Barco district known uh, and named because of the buildings that look like a barcode on your merchandise. They're black and white, unevenly um, spaced and of different widths. So it really does look like a barcode. In the center is the famous opera house with the walkable roof. And if that was summertime, there would be hundreds if not thousands of people on that roof. And then to the right is the Monk Museum. Norwegians love to go into the water year round. Uh, so luckily they have floating saunas or their own saunas. And here we saw some people go into the ice encrusted harbor waters. And it really is as cold as it shows on the right. And this is a famous iceberg sculpture that will turn around uh, once uh, taking 24 hours to turn. Another fabulous museum there along that walkway is the National Museum 
opened in 2022. That's where you'll see the original of this screen, probably Monk's best known work. And that color palette inspired the Nitty designers, Arnos and Carlos, who you're going to see in a little bit. Amazingly, while we were walking through there, we discovered a modern art installation with the same colors. That's my sister, Susan and me. A bit further on on the same uh, walk is the newest and most modern museum, the Astrup Fernley. And we found this friendly um, outdoor sculpture uh, right nearby. On another day, we were walking up and realized we needed more long underwear. And we went into the Hallie Hansen store and may, met these ski patrollers from the Yilo Ski Hills. And it was actually International Ski Patrollers Day. And so a portion of those proceeds went to help support them. The best known sculptor and most beloved sculptor in Norway is Gustav Vigeland. And there's about 200 of his sculptures in Frogner Park. That's the circle of life. And the photo on the right is the most beloved uh, sculpture, according to our tour guide. And that's called Angry Boy, as you can see. Um, next on our tour with uh, our guide was the Holman Ski Jumping Hill from 1892. It was supposed to be a chance for three of us in the tour to jump on that. I guess I was relieved that we didn't have to volunteer as it was family ski day. So as we were going up in the coach, we saw hundreds, probably thousands of people walking up the hill with their children or grandchildren. And there's just a few of the people there. Uh, interestingly, skiing is free in Norway. So that's cross country skiing. Uh, next, we were uh, fortunate enough to visit the <clears throat> Norsk Folk Museum or their Folk Museum, which um, tells about their cultural history and has also a lot of Norwegian buildings that have been brought there from other places in Norway. But unfortunately, going in February, it was treacherous, so they didn't have those open for us to see. Inside that building, we there's a big knitting display, and we were happy to find two Christmas balls uh, designed and knitted by our hosts, Arna and Carlos. So those are the two little balls on the right. Now, if you think of Norway and sweaters, you probably think of that one at the very top, that design. That's the Maria sweater, the most popular uh, design, and over 5 million copies have been sold of that design. And it became popular in a 1954 movie, and it was worn by a slalom skier and fighter pilot. Marius Eriksson, and he's the young man with the elf hat on the far right of that photo. This is an interesting uh, cabinet with about 130 tags uh, showing different parts of that costume. And that was done by dictionary editor and teacher Birgit Reeks. And that is part of the National Dictionary Project that took place from 1930 to 2016. Now, folk costumes are not just for museums. We were out uh, near the harbor and came across this young woman pushing her son in a stroller, and she was wearing it for his christening. She was on her way to the christening. So these are worn for important occasions. And when we asked her about her sweater, because that's a little unusual, uh, she shared with us that was handed by her grandmother. And if you are ever in Norway, um, people are very open. If you ask them, uh, you know, is that hand-knit sweater? Uh, did you do it? Or is there a little story with it? They will be 
uh, very accommodating to share that story. I'd like to look just at that costume for a minute because uh, we will be looking at uh, a store later on that sells them. And these shoes are very traditional and everything that she has there would be very traditional in the costume other than the red sweater. After our stay in Oslo, we went on the famous uh, train, the Bergen Bannon. It's about seven hours and about 120 tunnels later, you will end up in Bergen. I've taken a few views from the train for you. On the left here is the Yalo Ski Resort that the ski patrollers were from. And on the right is part of a difficult uh, athletic endeavor in the middle of winter. Then we ended finally in Bergen, uh, which has the oldest school of the Nordic countries. We'll say that they are very uh, highly educated, I found. And someone said they are the second most literate people in the world. Certainly, they all speak English, everybody we met. Most of them also speak uh, German. And of course, they speak Norwegian. On the top right are the traditional warehouse buildings. And the bottom right is the former customs house, which has been converted to a hotel. And that's where we spent the night. Uh, before we boarded the ship the next day. Okay. We were lucky enough to visit this wool mill, the Hilsavag wool mill, which is an eco museum and has been in the same family since 1898. They only use wool from Norwegian sheep and it's to a very high standard. So it's uh, less toxic to people, aquatic animals, etc. Just a few uh, shots from inside that factory. Certainly, if you get an opportunity to go there, find it, it was very interesting. And this is one of the brothers who runs the factory now. And he's in front of this machine that is from the time they first opened. And as explained to us, if anything goes wrong, well, they just have to make the parts because nobody makes that particular machine anymore. When we went up on the uh, funicular, we came across this troll. And can you tell if that's a genuine or a knockoff? <laughs> if you're ever out shopping looking for a troll, make sure it only has four digits. See, it has a thumb and three more digits, and that's a genuine Norwegian troll. Now it was time for us to go onto the boat. There are two... Um, Coastal Ferries, the Hurt and Gurton, and this newest one, the Havia. It's a very quiet way to travel, very sustainable. It has a rechargeable battery that can go four hours without needing to be recharged at the next port, and when necessary, also uses LNG. Here's my cabin. It's very soothing, Norwegian decor, of course, Norwegian wool. And I looked out on the side where everybody got on and off and the cargo got on and off. So that was lucky for me. Here we have hooks ready for that middle of the night announcement uh, over the public address system or your app that says there's the Northern Lights uh, can be seen. And by the, by the time I had the first sighting, there was probably four times as many clothes on there because you better dress warmly as the ship does not slow down at all uh, for Northern Lights. Here we are meeting our hosts and receiving our knitting kits. So that's Arn on the right, holding a kit on his wrist and Carlos, his husband and business partner. They're enthusiastic guides to everything Norway. As part of the sustainable uh, approach of this fleet, there are no buffets for, for food. It, all of it 
is served to you in small portions. You can have as much, many portions as you like, uh, but they only come in small amounts. And that's to hopefully uh, obtain their objective of reducing food waste to 75 grams per passenger per day, which if you've been on an other, another ship, you'll know is quite astonishing. Here's our first stop uh, where we could get off in Alessand. Um, the bottom right is the beautiful town of Alessand, which is Art Deco because there had been a fire uh, just before that time period. On the left is my sister. We're about to go up the hill, which the public address system had told us was a not to be missed uh, walk, although we were the only people from our group who went up there. And from the very top, you had astonishing views, including the one on the upper right of the screen, which shows you uh, part of Alessand. I must admit, I was the only, I, I didn't know that this was not for beginners, so I was the only one who didn't know how to knit, so I can't say it is very relaxing, but uh, the, all the people were very helpful and they found it relaxing and enjoyable. And now, here was an opportunity to see the Northern Lights without a lot of uh, light around. And the pictures I'm going to show you took place over 23 minutes from 11.37 to midnight. This is taken with my phone, the iPhone Pro Max 13, on night mode with maximum exposure. Uh, there is no editing of this. Um, you can find out more information about how to take uh, pictures with whatever kind of phone you have by Googling it. Uh, the two tips I would say are find the darkest place you can on deck, which is actually quite difficult to do because lights are on around the entire ship uh, for safety purposes and to brace your body as you are going full speed ahead on the ship. So now we'll see a few photos from that time period. Next day, we we're off to Trondheim to a Husfliden. Uh, these are uh, very interesting Norwegian stores owned by local arts and crafts associations. And they will make folk costumes or they will repair your folk costume. They pick the best of handcrafted regional products, most from Norway and the best of their Norwegian yarns and craft materials. You can see a bit of yarn over that lady's shoulder and they are wearing um, traditional costumes, our hostesses. Um, and this photo on the left is part of the group uh, that I was traveling with very enthusiastically, listening and absorbing everything from our her first Husfliden experience. And on the right, you can see our host again, Arnon, with the sweater he designed and knit, and Carlos. We sailed past this uh, lighthouse, where if you wish to, you can stay there in the summer. Finally, we're crossing the Arctic Circle, and that's the circle marker on the left. It's extremely cold as can be expected. Uh, an interesting fact is 10% of Norway's people live above the Arctic Circle, whereas in Canada, only 0.3 of our people live above that line. Uh, it's beautiful above the Arctic Circle in Norway. Here's Ornus in the mid-morning. The red buildings uh, you can see in this photo were traditionally for workers. Uh, but now are sought after by um, other people also. Once you've crossed the Arctic Circle, then you might partake in one of the rituals. On the left is my sister drinking some kind of hot gruel. 
And I am on the right uh, being uh, doused with freezing cold ice water from that bucket down my back by the, quote, Viking chief and rubbed straight into my back by his assistant. It was all good fun. And we had nice drinks afterwards. Uh, later on, we got a chance to get on land and take a hike. Uh, it's hard to tell in this photo, but she's standing on a very small rise and explain to us whenever you see a little rise, that will likely be a Viking burial mound. Um, this one's empty, as have been all of the mounds that they have looked into so far. So here's my mitts and me. Um, they, these were hand knit 46 years ago uh, by a Nor Norwegian woman. And interesting, that same design is being used uh, nowadays and on the hat I had bought in Alessand. Many of the ports, we didn't have an opportunity to get off the ship. It would be a very short stop, uh, but we could look out the window and enjoy a few photos. So here's one of the places that we didn't get off on. Some people like to sightsee from the outside deck and others never left the warmth of the panoramic lounge which we took over uh, half of it for our meeting. But one of the outings that we signed up for was for a reindeer ride, but unfortunately it had not snowed for over a week. So we couldn't take the ride as it's too dangerous for the reindeer if there's not fresh snow. So here's my sister feeding them 15 minutes later, it's sundown. Here's the other coastal ferry, the Hurton Gruten, which means fast route, and that has been going since 1893. One of the interesting places we had an opportunity to visit is the North Cape, and this is the North Cape marker. Up until 1956, the only route up to this spot was this cleft in the cliff. And 1956, the northern point of the E6 highway was completed. This is also the spot for the northern end of the E1, an international hiking trail that goes down to Italy. I'm trying to portray here just how cold and windy it is. Uh, so I hope you get a, just a little feeling about how absolutely freezing cold it is out there. There are many times when we didn't stop and here's another one in the middle of a snowstorm. These are an essential uh, ferries for the people that live up north. In here's in Honesvig, we were uh, privileged to see Bamsi, which is a full-sized um, reproduction of the St. Bernard, who was the heroic mascot of the, the Free Norwegian Forces and a symbol of Norwegian freedom in World War II. Children in Norway, just like children here, are trying to grapple with pollution and all those global challenges. And this artwork on the left was um, created by the grade seven students in Honesvig. Here we are approaching Kirkenes, the easternmost port that we would visit on this coastal route. It's Kirkenes, it's not getting any warmer. But the uh, certainly the, we had a very warm welcome in the Husflid store that we visited there. Kirken is, is a long way from everywhere, but about halfway between Oslo and the North Pole. 
On the right is our ship um, in this very severe conditions. And that is what you'll walk on if you go out for a walk. Um, there were very few of us that went out, but we did learn to walk like penguins, short steps, and with your arms out like wings. Here is our most northern sighting of the Northern Lights at 70 degrees latitude. Here's another place we did not stop at, but we did get to see the tradition of the candle or light in the window, as you can see on the building on the far left with the gray stripe, the three left windows. Here we are seeing the Hurt and Gruten again. It's been the lifeline to the north since 1893. And so beloved by Norwegians that half of the population watched the public broadcaster's telecast of the entire 134 hour journey. And that included our hosts who had watched every moment of that. Interesting thing about traveling is you can learn about something you never knew existed. And for me, that was the Struve Geodetic Arc Norway, the northernmost point, also the first UNESCO technical scientific heritage site. So three of us went from the ship to go look, to go walking and we just came up across this. Here's an explanation of it. Uh, from where we were standing, this the most northern sighting is Fuglins, which is the red dot at the top of the right picture. And you can see that these triangulations go right down to a little bit southwest of Odessa. And this was a major project undertaken to see whether the earth was round or flattened at the North and South Pole as uh, had been predicted. Uh, here's a picture of us by that um, marker uh, or marking that spot. An interesting fact um, that I found out both from somebody I spoke with on the first day of my travels and when pressed one of the staff members that there are no electric vehicles allowed on the Havia ships. And why? Because if an EV caught fire, everyone would have to don survival suits, go into a life raft or capsule, and the entire ship would be abandoned. So here's a, uh, one day from the sunrise on the left, calm and uh, clear skies to the right, where we are now in a major snowstorm. Going back, we are now crossing the circle marker again. And why are they able to get to these ports year round? It's because of the Gulf Stream that comes up. Here's the dining room and part of our group. The mo I think I spy eight or nine sweaters hand knit by this group of accomplished knitters. There's pretty places uh, to knit. And here's my sister and another lady knitting in uh, a well-lit spot. And if you don't want to knit, you can always look out the window and see the beautiful countryside in the upper right. And on the bottom is one of the... Uh, accomplished knitters uh, trying on a Norwegian uh, design that she had knit up and her husband being the willing model. Here's one of the shops that we went to. Strika Cafe means knitting cafe, welcoming people on Thursdays. And here we are in front of a display of Hillsvag wool. That was the wool mill I showed you the picture of with the mitts and uh, some more wool I bought or a stash as knitters call it. On our way back, we also uh, stopped at Trondheim, now uh, 
covered with snow the previous time it had been sunny. And there's a lot of gorgeous outdoor sculptures um, wherever we went in Norway. The famous Nadaros Cathedral and uh, one of the outdoor sculptures. On this picture on the left is a drawbridge that could be operated by hand. And on the right are some of the uh, colorful buildings that line that section of water. Here, here's a was a sobering moment uh, when we came across the July 22nd, 2011 memorial. That is a memorial uh, that recognizes the day when 70 lives were lost in two terrorist attacks in Norway, including uh, five young people from Trondheim. And at night, there will be 70 lights lit up in that water. Trondheim has also has modern architecture and sculptures, as we can see in this building. Christiansen was our last port for walking. And on our left, it was a sculpture of a fisherwoman with dried cod. And dried cod was very important in Norway. Um, oh, before they had oil, but a long time ago. And they supplied a lot of Europe with cod. That's so funny. So Norway has cod too. Another thing that's the same as Newfoundland. Yes. And mm -hmm. uh, came across cod, cod also when I was cod. just in Portugal. Oh. So. <laughs> so this was my first attempt uh, to knit a... Uh, with a color pattern and uh, it was a beautiful design. I, uh, I'm i not a very good knitter, but uh, that's our Arctic Circle uh, wrist warmer with the reindeer and the Arctic Circle marker. And here we had show and tell. So it was our last sailing night and our left we had um, Carlos uh, with one of the designs that they had made up and he was busy knitting it. And the right is Arnon, who learned how to knit when he was seven years old from his grandmother. And it's quite common that people uh, learn to knit very um, early on in their lives, whether they're boys or girls. And on the bottom right was a chance to say uh, goodbye. And uh, Arna and I are not getting fresh. It was actually very wavy and he was holding me up so I wouldn't fall over. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wearing my little wrist warmer. They were So now we're further south and getting closer to Bergen. And we can see a, a, a chance for Norwegians to swim in the water. They just it's just a part of their culture, they keep telling me, to swim year round. So the part at the front of that um, building is marked off if you want to swim in the water. Uh, I don't see anybody in there, but there was a lot of people in the outdoor pool there. Um, on our left is our pilot going back, I believe. And here's our bridge. We're going to go into the harbor, back to Bergen. And here's my sister and me who survived the cold. And here we are in Bergen again. Here is our last sunset, um, our last evening. And it was a very special time. And we felt very blessed to get yet one more beautiful sunset. And here are, we are home at last. Here's my husband who's hoping I would knit him a Norwegian sweater while I was away. But uh, I was luckier to find in a vintage shop this Lily Hammer 1994 Olympic sweater, which has all sorts of different motifs in it. And he's very happy with it. And I think 
I am under the uh, time, so there's time for questions now. But thank you. So thank you very much. And I will stop sharing. I think that's what I'm supposed to do, is it? Now? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. Let you me didn't change my view. Stop sharing. Yeah. There we go. Excellent. So, Linda, thank you so much for a spectacular talk. I have a first question. Is What motivated you to go to Norway to start to knit? And where did you get these 40-something uh, years old mitts from? Okay, well, I can answer part of it. Um, I was interested because I had been... Ooh, I don't know if you can see this. I had been in Nunavut. Can you see that? I can't see what you see. I don't. Yeah. Anyway, i had been in Nunavut um, the previous September. So I became very interested in the polar area. Then I had a chance to read this book, which is fantastic. The Greatest Polar Expedition of All Time, The Arctic Mission to the Epicenter of Climate Change by Marcus Rex, which was a number of nations getting together. And they they were interested in this because a pair of pants ended up off of a coast of Norway. And that's, um, anyway, I won't give it all away, but anyway, I really recommend this book. It's so fascinating. And um, how did we pick this in particular? My sister is a really good knitter, like, and so she had found this and she says, okay, Linda, you want to go? So she had me because it's polar, <laughs> not because it was knitting and she's sure anybody can learn to knit, but honestly, it's not so simple. Mm -hmm. And then these beautiful mitts, I hope you can see them here, were knit for me by a Norwegian woman who lives in or lived in, she's no longer alive, in West Vancouver. And I want to just tell you that you can tell that these are real um, Norwegian mitts because of the thumb. And you see that that thumb has a smaller copy of this design here. And that also how it goes in that shape like that. Compared to these, which I bought a number of years ago for only $10 to help support the nursing outposts in Newfoundland anyway. But you can see the difference in them and also in particular the thumb. And then this, these stripes, they also are another indication that it's a real Norwegian um, mitt. And then there's a whole way of reading these so did that answer your question? It did, thank you. <laughs> Maybe it's more than you wanted to know about it. So, so we have time. And so there must be some comments or questions from uh, people in the audience. If not, I could... Um... Well, so Linda, could I ask you a question? Certainly, what, Richard. What month, what time of year were you on the boat? It wasn't midwinter, I'm guessing. It was February, yes. Okay, it was so it February. Was. Wow. So very cold um, up there. Uh, uh, so the good thing is there's no mosquitoes. There's no bite, my biting <laughs> bugs because Norway apparently in their mountain and hiking areas is very bad bugs. The disadvantage is it's too cold. You can't go into the famous fjords, like the Geiger fjords. Uh, but certainly in the Northern Lights, we had them, I think, uh, five nights. Um, but the best nights were the two nights I showed you. And have how you been cold there? Did it get? How cold did it get? I don't know. It got cold enough that I wore three layers of long underwear below my jacket and my down coat, four hats. <laughs> um, uh, and outerwear just to be able to go and take those pictures 
Yeah, I have a whole pile. Let's see. Can you see this whole pile of long underwear and things? I was going to show you my whole costume of what I had to wear, but it was ridiculous. But <laughs> it was extremely cold. And then most people did not get off the ship. But my sister and I were determined we were going to see every speck of Norway possible. <laughs> I yeah. have a I have a question if you don't mind. Hi Joy, nice to Hi, see Linda. you. That was a fabulous presentation. Um, one question is how long was your trip? Um, and then secondly, you talked about sustainability of the food that they try to serve on the ship. Mm -hmm. Did they achieve that goal of what is it? Point how many grams? Per Seventy-five person? grams. That's not very much. That's so really we starving to death. No, that, no, that's a food waste. You know, uh -huh. if you've gone on a ship before, often people take, you know, a large plate. They take this, like, you know, you know, everything can make, just take a little bite. So their idea is they're, um, to plate up everything very beautifully from locally made um, foods and locally grown and locally raised uh to reduce the um, environmental impact. And then also, if they serve it to you in small portions, you can ask for two, three, four, the same thing if you want, but you're not going to end up wasting it. Did that answer your objective? If I could just, from what I saw, because most people um, did finish it up. Unless they really, really didn't like it, but most people wouldn't order it if they didn't like it. Oh, and that's why I'm wearing this, because I have this gold cord. Um, that meant that you could choose from the menu where you could have the local food. So every three days, the menu would change. Um, or you could order something like a hamburger if you wanted. Nobody did that, but you could. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Oh, did I tell you when we went? We went in February. Um, so we were gone for, I think, about 18 days, something like that, 18 or 20 days. So if I could ask another question, Linda, and, and I did enjoy sure. your talk. I thought it was just brilliant. But the ship, is it, would you say, primarily a tourist ship that carries some freight, or is it a freight ship that carries some tourists? Now, that's a good question, because um, it is actually, I guess, like for us, or for the people that live on the coast, it's like the bus. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the bus here, because some people would just go, you know, from one stop to the next. Okay. That's how they do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the people just wait, uh, you know, if they're only going a short stop. And then there we have a whole... A number of people that are going for a long time but really it is the way apparently it, it would take months and before the ferry system came in the hurt and gruten in the late 1800s it would take months and months for any mail or anything to get there and now it would be well it couldn't be more than a, a week even if you started at one end or the other so it really is a vital part uh, and but it doesn't always stop that, that was interesting. Alisa and I was saying, oh, how nice it is, you know, and it's so sunny and, and it's so uh, calm and wow, it's February. I wouldn't think. And then they were saying, well, last week it was so stormy that they couldn't stop there. So when that happens, the people just have to get off, you know, on another spot and then take a, a coach back to where they want to go. So you said it was electric. Did it have to charge up then? It stopped every four hours and charge? And how long did it take to charge? Well, I'm not an expert on this. <laughs> but yes, it can go up to four hours. And apparently when it was in dock, it would charge up. But it can't, I don't think it could, it could go all of those distances because sometimes we went a long way, especially further up north when there's not as uh well there's not as many stops because we're going through the night like you're just barreling straight ahead through the night yes 
Hello? Lovely, pic lovely pictures. And how did you organize the trip from here? How did you make the arrangements to go on the ship? Oh, um, Arnold and Carlos um, have uh, several trips they do a year to different places. And my sister, how I found out about this is my sister uh, follows them on Instagram and whatever their blogs. And so she found out about this. And so they made the arrangements for the ship. And they made the arrangements for the extra um, tours we did, like to the Hilsavag uh, mill and that things. Um, and then for Oslo, we just took extra nights in the hotel. But it also was actually very easy to get around because we were on our own for several days. Um, super easy to, the moment you arrive in Oslo, they have uh, this fast, um, I would call it a metro. I guess it's actually a train, but you just get off at the luggage. You There's a little vending machine. You just buy your little ticket. You walk maybe another few minutes and you just get right on it and it pops you out in the central station. And from there you can go like anywhere. And our hotel is just across the street. And then you can buy a um, Oslo pass, which if you're 67 or older, that's their seniors age there, it's reduced. And that will get you the uh, trams, which we did take when we went further along on some of those museums and a lot of museum entries and a map and everything. It's really well set up. Did that sort of answer your question? Yes, and then we just you. went, uh, you know, got an air flight, but the rest of it was. So Linda, can I ask really... you, when you were up north, you had some four layer underwear yes. days in Oslo. <laughs> Was it, you say it was one layer or two layers? Uh, it depended on whether it was um, windy or not. That is what is extremely uh, makes the big difference is the wind chill factor. But I would say it's definitely cold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially as we only went with carry-on luggage. So it's very challenging, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, so we each bought two more layers of long underwear top and bottom to put on what we already brought. <laughs> it's, it is very cold, especially on the ship. And especially if we like to get up early to take photos. Um, but uh, you certainly can buy long underwear anywhere, mitts, mm -hmm. gloves, even on the ship. If you've forgotten, they sell all that on there. Yes. Linda, can I, yes. can I ask? Can I ask if the wool in Norway is expensive to buy? Did you get a feeling for that? Oh, you know what the amazing thing is, is it's much more reasonable, the high quality wool, like the Norwegian wool, than it is here. Oh my goodness. It's like, I don't know why. I don't, maybe we have a lot of taxes or something, but it is much more reasonable. So now I have a, a big stack of wool with all these beautiful colors, even though I'm not a knitter. But um, like people would go out with four or five bags of wool from Hillsbag. And mm -hmm. the, so these husbands had a good job, as they said, we're always carrying all of the wool. Are you doing... It looks it looks like the 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 two men are on uh, YouTube as well. They have uh, how to knit videos, etc. Oh uh, yes, they're on YouTube. Oh, yes, there's all sorts of videos, and they also go to other places. Uh, Svalbard, which is the further, much further north, and also part of Norway. They have cruises up there. And um, but Japan, they were, uh, they have a, a connection with Japan because they were Comme de Garçon before, which is a designer. But also following the tsunami, they went over. Um, to assist there, uh, to do um, knitting and other things with people, um, to help people, I, I guess they come to terms or feel better as many uh, different people did in the world go over to Japan. 
Are you a knitter? No. <laughs> yeah. But if there are no other questions, let me see. Anybody else? Uh, just tip in because I can't see everybody. No, nobody else wishes to ask anything. Again, I want to thank Linda for a really excellent presentation today. And uh, like I said before, it's great to have somebody from the Faculty Women's Club join us instead of uh, the other way around, which we sometimes come to your presentations as I've talked at your presentation. So it's great. So thank you for volunteering. So thank you. And before we leave, just to mention that we are not going to have a travel group session in December because it'll be right around Christmas time, the third or fourth week of the month usually. So our next session will be in the third or fourth week of January. You'll be getting a notice about the specific date and what it's going to be all about. Uh, we have a number of speakers organized for early next year. But we still need a couple more speakers to round out the year before the summer comes around. So hopefully some of you have been traveling. And even if you haven't been traveling recently, we'd be happy to have you come and talk to the group about some place uh, or something to do with travel that has happened in the past. So please just let me know. Um, particularly, I'd love to have one or two new speakers. Uh, to join our group. So thank you very much and all the best over the holiday season. We'll see you in January. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for all your coaching. <laughs> thank you. You're very welcome. And